Hello and welcome to day three of Loop TV's coverage at Oshkosh and what a packed show we have just for you. But first, some news. As you saw in yesterday's show, we brought you the Viva, Unique's new electric moto glider. Now all of their aircraft are electric powered and some of the major manufacturers are starting to take note. Cessna has announced plans that it's going to build its own electric aircraft that will be based on the 172. It's only in the planning stage at the moment, but as soon as we know more, so will you. Alongside Cessna, Sikorsky have also shown their interest by showing off their electric Schweizer 300. We'll show you more of that later on in the week. In other news, Icon has announced some design tweaks to its amphibious A5. It has also announced that Liberty Aerospace will be building some of its composite parts. Great news for both companies. Right, now on with the show. DC choose the fat with friend of Loop TV and current Kestrel top bod, Alan Klapmeyer. I answer a reader's question, but first, Rich takes a look at the KC-100 from KAI Aerospace, a brand new aircraft from a brand new manufacturer based out of Korea. Now, another new aircraft to bring here at Oshkosh, and another rival to the Cirrus SR-22, or the Cessna 400. Hmm. We saw the French CO-50 Cobalt on Monday. Today we're going to show you a brand new Korean design by a company that's enormous, very well known, makes military aircraft all around the world, but you've probably never heard of. It's a Korean Aerospace Industries KC-100. Let's have a look at it now. I can tell you they make really nice lollies. Uh, our current vision is uh, our military aircraft and aero structures for Boeing and Airbus. But now our management decided that we need to expand into civil aircraft business to grow the company. This uh, KC-100 is a low risk project to test our ability to engineer and the market is a uh, small aircraft. Uh, if if we can do this right with this small aircraft, then we can uh, move into something bigger with more confidence. Wow. This shape is this uh, proof of a concept aircraft for the, uh, the bilateral air safety agreement between the US and South Korea. And the production version will look different. Uh, we may switch to a more fuel efficient engine, such as a diesel one. And uh, we are thinking about uh, making it more light, as offering the more useful one. So, so what are the numbers that are attached to the KC-100? The max cruising speed will be about uh, 210 knots and the uh, maximum takeoff weight is uh, 3,600 pounds and the useful load is uh, 1,100 pounds. TCM is uh, developing a diesel engine about uh, 230 horsepower, I think, and we will consider that when it enters the market. Now we are building the, the first prototype and the first flight will be in June next year and uh, our target date for certification is 2013. It will be built entirely in Korea uh, with 100% uh, uh, carbon fiber. What sort of price point are you thinking of? Uh, of course we would like to offer it as a competitive price and um, at the moment the, the similarly equipped aircraft may cost about um, 600,000 US dollars. Thank you, sir. As you know, we've been asking viewers to send in their questions to TV at loop.aero, and that's exactly what Henrik Darlington did. He wanted to know what Delta Hawk engines are currently working on, so let's take a look. So, Stoney, can you tell us a bit about the Delta Hawk engine? It is a 202 cubic inch engine. It develops either 160, 180, or 200 horsepower. It's supercharged and turbocharged, and is a water-cooled engine. It was a purposely built diesel engine with no gearbox. Uh, it's 40% fuel parts. Uh, it's about 30% more efficient than a regular gasoline engine. And it weighs about the same as an uh, IO 360 like 150 horsepower engine, it'll burn about eight and a half gallons an hour, and it'll do that all the way up to 18,000 feet. It can fly at 60 degrees up, 60 degrees down indefinitely. By changing a couple of parts, we can run it either as a, uh, a V or an A. So the engine can roll and be upside down, it just depends on where we put the uh, oil pickup to return. The thing you got to understand, it's a dry sump engine, and all the oil is off the engine, and there's an external oil pump that takes oil out of the reservoir. 
and supplies it to the engine. So as long as it can pull oil out of the reservoir, it can fly in any position. What general aviation aircraft do you see this going into? Our first aircraft uh, that we're working with our partner, La Presti Aviation, the Speed Merchant, is to go in an SR-20. We have already taken the old engine out and put in the new uh, engine mount. Uh, we have an engine that's in it that we're setting up all the radiators, and we expect that aircraft to fly as fast as 190 knots at altitude. Because it's a turbocharged engine, it can actually climb and fly a lot further than what a normally aspirated SR-20 would do. Uh, is it already certified? Our certification uh, is in process right now. We expect to have it completed by the end of this year, first part or first quarter next year. There you go, Henrik. I hope that answered your question for you. Now it's over to DC with an old friend of the Loop Show, Alan Clapmeyer. It's just over a week ago that Alan Clapmeyer, former boss of Cirrus, was announced as the head of Kestrel Aircraft. Let's see what he's got to say for himself. How did you get involved with Kestrel? Since the possibilities of buying the Cirrus Vision program fell through last August, we've been approached by a lot of different companies and approached others. So this team that I've been working with have reviewed lots of different projects. Kestrel was an interesting alternative. So the question was, how did our team feel about the market niche for this airplane? How much work had they accomplished? What was what it looked like from a remaining point of view? And third was, if we were going to get involved, how were we going to finance it? And those pieces just fell together quite comfortably. Tell us about the aircraft and what appeals to you about it. I'm still a big believer in single-engine jets as a personal jet and what they will be able to do. But I think we were always pretty clear about what we thought it wouldn't do. And the single jets will have compromises when it comes to payload versus range. So the turboprop market ends up being a different niche than the jets. This isn't a competitor, it's an alternative. So if it's going to be heavier and more expensive, you have to figure out what that value is you're going to give it the customer. In this case then, the turboprops are about payload, range, and short field runways, which the jets also aren't great at. Then it came down to, well, how does this airplane do towards hitting those goals, and how far along the path is it? It's a really big airplane. It's not as big as a PC-12 inside, but bigger than a TBM, and very much larger than the single-engine jets. Second part of that is being able to fly the long range, and this airplane has that too. You know, it's, it's good low drag airframe, so it's going to be more efficient. It's either going to fly faster or need less power, depending upon which way you look at it. Then the last piece is just how do you get it in and out of short fields, which I think is necessary to, again, make it worth it for this. And that's about reversing propellers, and there are things we'll, we'll still look at on the landing gear and the flap system and so on, but you know, it'll, it'll fit out the last part of that value. Are you going to make any major changes to the airplane? There's going to be a number of changes, starting with the wing. Uh, it's got a curved wing, and as a Spitfire lover, I wouldn't mind seeing a full elliptical wing. In this case, just the leading edge is curved, which has led to a bent spar, which costs more and is heavier. There's just not enough advantage to that, so the wing will get straighter in order to lower the weight and lower the cost of the wing. We'll be certainly looking at the engine. It's a very, very large PT-6. It's a Dash 67. And I'm not convinced yet that we need all of that performance. But the current airplane, as a proof of concept airplane, is very fast. Part of that speed is the aerodynamics. Part of it is a giant engine. Giant engines are expensive. You know, so we want to re-look at that from a customer point of view. And then, of course, the last very obvious change is the, the, the cockpit, which will change, obviously, to a glass cockpit and you know, a, a simpler to use system. Do you have a date in your mind when you will deliver your first aircraft? Yes, we do. Could you tell us what it, <laughs> could you tell us what it is? No, as, as I said, we, I mean, we really don't have a schedule at this point. A, a rough time frame would be three years, but it could be two years, it could be four years. We really do want to make sure that we go through all of the engineering and the scheduling first and carefully think out what the new schedule will be. This time, in a year's time, next year's Oshkosh, we'll have a next generation uh, Kestrel to show? Uh, there will be a next generation Kestrel, yeah. I, by, by a year from now, I would hope so, because I don't know how to fly with these round instruments anymore. <laughs> I've got them in my chipmunk, I just don't look at them. So, <laughs> in this airplane, I don't know what to do. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. Thank you. Pleasure talking to you.
Thanks DC, exciting stuff. Well that's it I'm afraid today viewers, but remember if you've got any questions email us at tv at loop.aero and make sure you tune in tomorrow where we'll be bringing you more from Air Venture Oshkosh. I'm off to see the air show.